Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and today we'll be taking a look at a ultra budget option for those of you building new systems, and maybe you're looking towards some of the newer Ryzen 5000 processors or a cheap Ryzen 3000 processor. This is possibly right up your street. This is the Gigabyte A520MH, and you can find out a lot more about it after this. Okay, so this is the Gigabyte A520MH. This is, like I said, a ultra budget board. This at the moment in the UK is retailing for around about the £60 mark, £59.99. I managed to pick this up as a bargain, thanks to one of our Discord members, C. McKnight, who pointed out as a open box option on CCL. And I managed to pick this up for £53 and two pence, including postage, which for me for £50 for a motherboard seems absolutely brilliant. It is A520 chipset, so it's a modern chipset. This is essentially going to be the replacement for most of the A320 boards that are out on the market now. So if you're possibly thinking of a budget PC and you're looking towards the A320 chipset boards, I would certainly pause, think about it, check out the rest of this video, and then make a decision after that. So what is the A520 chipset? Well, the A520 chipset is a cut-down version of the B550 and X570 chipsets. It does leave out PCI Express Generation 4, but still does give you a lot of flexibility and also a little bit of future proofing for those new processors which will be coming out in approximately three or four days. Although this has been cut back a little bit from its B550 stablemates, it does offer a lot of features and certainly is an upgrade over the A320 models. This particular version upgraded features such as double the memory capacity, so this will take up to 64 gigs of RAM as opposed to the previous version which was 32 gigs of RAM. Also we've got these really nice added features such as digital RGB and standard 12 volt RGB which on pretty much all of the A320 boards was missing. So let's take a look at the packaging, have a quick tour of the motherboard, then we're going to fire up, take a look at the BIOS and see what is in there and then I'll come back with my final thoughts. So first of all, looking at the packaging, actually, yeah, pretty decent packaging, pretty much what you'd expect. It uh, doesn't do a great deal more than hold the product itself, but certainly looks nice, so if you're buying this as a present for someone, I think they'll be pretty pleased with it. On the front of the box, we've got the features such as the A520 markings there, also support for AMD processors and the AM520 chipset logo there. Oh yeah, pretty much does what it says. This is one of the UD range, or ultra durable boards from Gigabyte, which are pretty much known to be very long lasting, although slightly limited on features. On the sides of the box, uh, pretty much the same deal. So we've got some specifications on the front tag, uh, more product markings on the sides, etc. Nothing to write home about. On the back, it goes into more detail about the individual board and also some of the features as we are used to seeing. So it's got ultra durable markings on there. It's got the four plus three Digi PWM design technology. So the VRMs on this actually are pretty decent. We'll take a closer look at those a little bit later when we get the board out of the box. But essentially this is a four plus three setup and it's using the on semiconductors and it's the four C 09s and the four C sixes, I believe. We'll have a closer look at those again later. But essentially this is pretty much the same setup as a lot of the B550 Gigabyte boards and even some of the older MSI boards, things like the Tomahawk, etc. So a very, very similar setup as in phases. The actual VRMs themselves are slightly lesser, but this is currently compatible with all AMD processors in the 3000 range, right the way up to the whopping 3950X. Now if you want to see how this actually fared with the 3950X, Bill Zoy did a fantastic video checking out the VRMs and actually some B-clock overclocking on this. So even though it is an A520 chipset, there is a little bit of overclocking allowed, not in the multiplier, but in the B-clock. So if you're feeling brave, you can certainly tweak your processors and get a little bit more extra performance out of them. So it goes into a little bit more details of the actual specification of the motherboard and the chipset, which we'll go through now. So we've got CPU support for third gen AMD Ryzen processors on the AM4 socket and using the A520 chipset. Graphics interface is a PCI Express Gen 3x16. We've got a display interface of HDMI and DVI-D. Memory type is dual channel DDR4, and it has two DIMM slots. Expansion slots, we've got two PCI Express Gen 3x1 ports. And SATA, we've got four SATA ports. It's SATA 3, 6 gigabit per second, and one M.2 for SSD. So that supports both SSD SATA and also SSD NVMe. Also supports SATA RAID. Audio is with the Realtek ALC887. LAN is catered for by the Gigabyte Gaming Gigabyte LAN and USBs. We've got six USB 3.2 Gen 1s and six USB 2.0. These are also included with the headers. And the form factor is micro ATX. 
So that gives you a brief rundown of what it can actually do. Also, again, it goes into details about the 8118 chipset, which is for the Realtek LAN, which has got uh, bandwidth management, etc. Also, it discusses the RGB on there, so it's RGB Fusion 2.0. So if you've used Gigabyte Board before and you know how flexible the actual software is, a really, really nice addition. Again, both 12 volt and digital 5 volt RGB. Also, there's QR code, so if you want to check that out, I'll put that on the screen now so you can scan it and see what the instruction manual and all the details of the board itself on their website. So that is pretty much it for the box. Let's see what we actually get inside it. So pretty much uh, a very basic thing in here. We don't get a great deal. We get a silver IO shield, which uh, yeah, certainly is functional. We get a couple of SATA cables, one of which is right angled, the other one is straight. We get the motherboard itself. And delving a little bit deeper, we've got a Gigabyte DVD with all your drivers and utilities, that kind of thing. There is a very basic user manual pamphlet. Multilingual installation guide. And something in French. Okay, so let's have a quick look around the board and see what we actually get. So it's a, yeah, it's a pretty basic setup. This is Micro ATX, so it's designed to fit in those smaller form factor cases. Obviously, you can, if you want to, put this in a full-size ATX chassis, but you will have a quite a big gap between the bottom of the board and the bottom of the case itself. So, yeah, ideally, this is a micro ATX special. But even though it is small, it is still quite mighty. And we can tell that because we've got a 8-pin power connector up here to supply extra power to AMD processors. Also, down this side here, we've got our VRM. So this is the 4 plus 3 setup, again, using the on-semiconductor technologies. I think it's the 4 c 9 ns I'll try and get some close-ups. I'm pretty sure that's what it is on the high side and the 4C06s on the low side. Again, this is pretty much exactly the same as you get on some of the B550 boards, the Aorus Pros, etc, etc. The only difference being is on those you do get a massive heatsink over the top of those to keep things a little bit cooler. But like I said, Buildzoid did a review on this or a test with this with the 3950X and even under full load, the VRMs were getting to around about the 100 degrees mark which is absolutely fine. It is a little bit on the high side, but again, this motherboard is not really aimed at those kind of processors. It's designed at your Ryzen 3s, Ryzen 5s, Ryzen 7s. Ryzen 9 is probably a little bit too high for this kind of category of motherboard. But of course, if you want to, you can put it on there and it will work and it won't crash. It will actually throttle slightly. Most of those chips, the 3950X, will kind of boost up to around about 144 watts of use whereas this does seem to have some kind of thermal limitation or at least a VRM limitation and will only allow the processor to boost up to around about 130 watts, at least in Buildzoid's testing. So obviously, if you're going to get a processor, which is a little bit less, then you're going to have no issues whatsoever. It isn't going to throttle and it's just going to run as intended, albeit the VRMs will get slightly warmer than they would if you had a heatsink on them. Obviously, if you want to, you can buy cheap stick-on heatsinks, which you could relatively easily put onto the side there to keep them a little bit cooler if you wanted to. Ideally, with the stock cooler, with most of the Ryzen 3s, 5s and 7s, with the downdraft, you're going to get a little bit of extra airflow going over the VRM section, which will keep things nice and cool. So moving along, we've got our first of our fan headers. This is a CPU fan header, obviously for your AM4 processor sockets. All of the fan headers on here are the hybrid type, so they can be used for water pumps, fans, whatever the case may be, and you can control them both from PWM or DC voltage. There are actually three headers on this board, so I'll get that out of the way first of all, because I know I'm gonna get questions asking, but there are three headers in total. So you've got a CPU header at the top here, we've got a chassis fan header at the rear, and also we've got a chassis fan header towards the bottom front. So pretty much all the bases are covered on this. Moving across, we've got two RAM slots. Again, that isn't particularly brilliant. It would have been really nice to see four slots on here, but as part of the cost saving measures, obviously two extra slots, more traces, etc., etc makes it more expensive to build. So if you do want to have four slots, then obviously you do need to go with the product stack a little bit more, but essentially this is absolutely fine. Again, it supports up to 64 gigs of RAM, so you could put two 32 gig sticks in there should you be able to afford them. But realistically, I think most people will be fine with possibly two eights in here for that really budget system. Moving across from the RAM slots, we've got our 24 pin power connector, pretty much standard effect. There are no debug LEDs on this. So as far as it goes for testing and setup, there are no LEDs on here to tell you what is the problem, should you have an issue. But what is quite nice, there is actually a BIOS flash button on the back, so you can flash the BIOS. We'll take a little look at that later on and go into a little bit more depth. Moving down slightly more, we've got our NVMe or M.2 slot, so that supports, like I said, SATA SSDs or M.2 SSDs. 
What I find on this is actually quite an unusual feature, and I actually quite like it, is rather than having the standoffs, which are made of metal, and a tiny little screw, which you have to fumble around with, this actually has a plastic locator with a little pin in there, so you can put your drive in, push the pin down, and it snaps into place. I actually really like this design, and I'd like to see this actually implemented on the more expensive range of the boards. Moving across from your NVMe or M.2 slot, we've got our first of our PCI Express Gen 3 times one slots. There's another one at the bottom there, so if you wanted to add on an additional card, you can do. The layout of this, I actually quite like the fact that the M.2 drive is above your graphics card slot, so if you are using a graphics card, you're not gonna find the drive overheating because of it being sandwiched underneath the graphics card. So this is a pretty decent layout in my opinion. Moving down a little bit further, we've got another one of our PCI Express Gen 3 times one ports. Again, for expansion cards, you can put one in the top or bottom, so capture cards, uh, LAN cards, that sort of thing. Uh, Wi-Fi cards, I guess, would be probably one of the main things people will be looking at putting in this due to the fact of this board not having any onboard Wi-Fi. Moving back across to this side, we've got our four SATA ports, so the SATA 3, so 6 gigabit per second, and this does support RAID 0 and RAID 1 if you wanted to. Moving across, we've got our system fan header, like I said earlier, so again, 4-pin PWM or DC supported. Next up, we've got our USB 3.2 Gen 2, so for your front panel connectors. Next that we've got our front I.O. connection, so usual deal, hard drive LED, reset switches, power button, etc, etc. There's a CMOS reset, and next that there is a pair of USB 2.0 ports. So again, if you want to add extra USB ports or front panel connections, this is where you'll be plugging them in. Next up, we've got a COM port, which for some reason, they still seem intent on adding these things. I don't know anyone who's used a COM port, probably in the last five to 10 years, but still, it's there should you need it. Next, that is your TPM or Trusted Platform Module, so you can plug one into there. And next, that is the excellent addition of our 5 volt addressable RGB or 12 volt standard RGB. So, if you want to connect this up to RGB in a case, whatever the setup may be, you can plug those in there, no problems at all. Again, that is controlled with RGB Fusion 2.0, can be controlled both in software and also in the BIOS, should you wish to. Next up, we've got our front panel audio connector. Now, the front audio is the ALC887, as we said a little bit earlier. So this does support 7.1 audio, but unfortunately, on the rear, the jacks, you've only got three jacks, so if you do want to have a 7.1 sound setup, you will need to use your front panel headers for that, which is a little bit messy, but I think realistically, for this kind of level of board at the budget end, most people are going to be absolutely fine with a set of desktop speakers or maybe plugging in a headset. So I don't see that as necessarily being a bad thing, but it certainly gets the job done. The audio setup down in the bottom corner uses Japanese capacitors and also there is an isolation area to keep the sound and distortion to a minimum. And that takes us round to the back of the board. So on the back, this is all of our I.O. So we've got two USB 2.0 ports. Also, we've got a combo keyboard and mouse port should you wish to use it. Next that, you've got your DVI-D, which supports up to 1080p at 60 hertz. Next that, we've got our HDMI port, so that's HDMI 2. And again, that will support 4K at 60 frames per second. Moving on, we've got the first pair of our USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports. One of them's actually colored in white, and that is to differentiate it. This is designed for your BIOS flashback. So a really nice feature to see on a board of this kind of level is Quick Flash. So this supports Quick Flash Plus. So you can download the BIOS from the Gigabytes website, put it into a USB stick. All you need to do is connect up the power to the board, and then you can go ahead and press the button and then you can flash the BIOS to the latest version. So maybe if you're buying this board now, but you're waiting for the latest and greatest of the 5000 series processors to come out, you can rest assured that you'll be able to flash the BIOS very easily and get your new processor up and running without having to worry about BIOS revisions, that kind of thing. Obviously that will entail you needing another PC to gain access to the Gigabyte website to download the BIOS. If you wanna know more about how that works, we will be doing a dedicated video on how to flash the BIOS on this particular motherboard, so stay tuned for that. Next up, we've got another two USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, and above that, we've got our Realtek 8118 gigabit LAN port. Next up, we've got our audio, so we've got our line, earphone, and microphone connectors. Again, in the software for the Realtek, you can set those up and set them exactly how you want to, so you can have two outputs, three outputs, whatever the case may be. Pretty flexible in that Realtek software. So that is pretty much it for the board. Next thing for us to do is to get some actual processors and RAM on this, get up and running, and we'll take a quick look at the BIOS. Okay, so we've got the system booted up. Currently, this is running with a Ryzen 3 3100. We've got some V-Color RAM, which is the Prism Pro, which looks really nice. Uh, GeForce GTX 1650 Super from Zotac. And SSD-wise, we've got a Silicon Power M.2 drive, so Gen 3 drive, so absolutely perfect. 
and happy to say that it booted up first time, no issues whatsoever. Although, rookie mistake, I didn't plug in the GPU power, so there was that to it. But there was a nice message on the screen that said, please turn off the system and reconnect your GPU, which for first time builders or rookies, or even for the experience who make the mistake, it's nice to know that if the system isn't booting for some reason, there will be something on the screen to show you why it's not booting. So we really like that a lot. So looking at the BIOS when we first go in, so first of all, it goes into easy mode, and we've got pretty much most of the information there that you could possibly want. So it says the motherboard version, the BIOS version, the CPU, processor, RAM, etc. Uh, it's actually a really nice layout. I really like this. It's a little bit different from Gigabyte. So this is a really nice setup in my opinion. So currently we're in easy mode. So let's go in and we can change the XMP. And this board actually supports up to, I think it's around about 5,100 megahertz on the DDR4, which currently I don't think you can actually buy. So it does mean there's a little bit of future proof in there. If we click on the XMP profile, we can choose our DDR and it's picked it up as DDR4 4000 uh, CL19. So we can choose that. Oh, that's actually selected already. In the bottom left, we've got our boot sequences. So Windows uh, Boot Manager, etc., etc. You can go ahead and change all those things. We've got our temperatures and the frequencies. So CPU frequency is a uh, 36 point. Sorry. So the CPU frequency is 3606.62 megahertz. CPU temp currently 33 degrees, which is uh, pretty awesome. And we've got all other details there. So actually the VRM currently is running at 31 degrees. So yeah, that's pretty decent. So let's take a look at the advanced mode. So in advanced mode, you've got your usual kind of settings. So you've got your favorites, your tweaker, used to be called AI tweaker, I believe before, settings, system info, boot options, save and exit. So in the CPU clock control, you've got auto. I don't think we can actually change that. Uh, CPU clock ratio. No, it doesn't appear we can change any of that, so that is just set to auto. In advanced CPU settings, we've got options for Core Performance Boost or PBO. We've got SMV mode, so if you want to uh, add virtualization, so maybe if you're running some sort of virtual machine on here, you can enable that or disable it. Calling quiet, uh, PCC adjustment, global C state controls, power supply idle control, CCD control. Down core control, SMT mode, CPPC, and CPPC preferred cores. Uh, if we go into that, you can choose enabled, disabled, etc. Press escape to get back out. So, yeah, extreme memory profile we can add, multiplier, advanced memory settings. So, if you want to go in there and change the sub timings, you can click on that and you can change your settings accordingly. So, that's uh, pretty cool. Pretty much standard features, but it's probably nice that you guys can see this if you're possibly thinking about getting this. So CPU VRM settings, let's see if we can actually select that. And yeah, you've got your uh, CPU load line calibration and your vCore SOC. So in load line calibration, it doesn't appear that we can actually change that at all. So that is just defaulting to auto. So it doesn't appear to be any options there to change that. This is on the BIOS version. I think I said it was F1, which was the first one. Let's go back into easy mode. It should say which one is on there, or does it say here? No, it doesn't say on there anywhere. So back into easy mode. Yeah, this is BIOS version F1. I believe there's actually two or three more extra BIOSes up from this. So I think there's an F10 and an F20. Again, we'll be doing a full video on how to flash the BIOS in a later video. And we'll see if it actually adds any more features or any more tweaks that we can do. But we've got option there for smart fan 5, so you can go in and change all your fan settings, that kind of thing, based on CPU temperature, or there are, I think there's five different settings on here, so yeah, five different settings you can choose, so system 1 temperature, uh, the VSOC MOS temperature, PCH temperature, or VRM MOS temperature, so depending on which fan it is, you can choose to have it more uh, active towards certain areas of the motherboard, which again, is pretty flexible. Not often you get that on a budget board, especially on a low price one such as this. So yeah, overall, very nice. All laid out very nicely. I don't think there's any real complaints there. Pretty much everything you could want on there. The only thing obviously that you don't get is the ability to change the clock speed or the, the multiplier speed. So that is a little bit unfortunate for those who like your overclocking. I think for most people, for general use and for having a little bit of a tweak in the system, this is absolutely fine. Again, if you're building this system or building a system for somebody, 
and you don't necessarily want them going in and doing all kinds of crazy overclocking, this is going to be absolutely perfect. Most of the newer Ryzen processors, the 3000 series, even the 4000 APUs, and the upcoming 5000 CPUs, I'm pretty much banking on the fact that they are not going to have a great deal of overclocking headroom to them, and it's easier just to select the PBO or Precision Boost Overclock and just let it do what it can based on thermal and obviously voltage requirements. So I think that pretty much wraps up. We've had a quick look at the BIOS, some of the settings in there. Again, if there's any extra bits that you'd like to see on this, please do let us know in the comments section below where we'll try and either do a dedicated video or include it in a follow-up video to this. But overall, yeah, I'm very pleased. For £53.02, and pence, which I personally paid, this is absolutely brilliant. I'm going to put this into a, uh, a modest system, either to sell or to use as a media centre, that kind of thing. But realistically, you can put any processor you want in there. It's going to be really interesting to see what comes out from AMD in the next couple of days or weeks, uh, especially on the APU front. Obviously, this is a A520 chipset. Currently, it doesn't support any of the uh, APUs, like the 2200G or the 3200G, although some people have reported some success in getting those to work, although they're not officially supported. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out. Hopefully, there's going to be a 4000 series APU available on the market very shortly, which will fit into this system very, very nicely. So that's been the Gigabyte A520MH. I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To. And hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.